Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious, beautiful, incredible day, Lord. Uh, just what an awesome day to serve you. Every day is an awesome day to serve you. Uh, but Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the sun that's shining, for the birds that are chirping. We thank you for this gathering of believers who uh, lift their voices on high to you, God, who believe in you, who love you, want to serve you and honor you, God. I pray for our pastor and the message that he preaches today. May it be honoring to you. And we just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We are in the midst of a series in the book of Revelation. We are in the midst of the tribulation in that series right now. In a moment, we're going to put up a chart to kind of show you our view of the entire book of Revelation. But and that can stay up, that's fine. But I, I want to share with you guys uh, something that happened yesterday. You know, Jim's father passed away. We had a funeral and also a uh, burial for him yesterday. And I happened to be at the burial, and I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to be impacted by it forever because I, I, I have a vision of what happened there, and I think it's a healthy one for us all to consider. Um, I don't know if they how it all happened, but it seems like at this at this cemetery, they filled it from the back to the front. So there's a road, and and the cemetery is fairly full of, you know, bodies that have been buried. But Jim's dad got one more towards the front, towards the road, and it seems like that's where there's more space maybe available for people to be buried in the future. So if you picture this, you know, the crowd of people there for the funeral was there. The road's on that side. There's no one buried that way. Um standing like this and Jim's dad's burial is behind me and the entire cemetery is behind me so there's all kinds of tombstones you know all the way all the way behind me and you know I mentioned to them that you know that's the destiny of all of us for our bodies we're all gonna be there one day that's one thing that is for sure except for the rapture if it happens and some people may not have to die at all what a glorious thing that'll be. But despite that, um, that's the destiny of all. And I think, you know, this book of Revelation, and especially where we're at right now, is about judgment. And uh, it's not that I look forward to discussing uh, the judgment that's coming upon this earth. And I'm not exactly sure what's going on with the mic, but there's a lot of feedback. But... Uh, Judgment's coming, church. Judgment's coming. And, you know, I think you guys are here because you believe in Jesus. Praise God for that. And I believe as a result of that, you're going to get spared judgment. But judgment's coming upon this world. And that gives us an urgency, first of all, for our loved ones and our family to not have to face that judgment um, so it gives us motivation to, to share the gospel. And I, I think that's an important thing that we all have. Is there something I should need to do? No? Oh, really? Okay. So I want to share with you t uh, this, this chart. And thank you, Larry, if he's in the room for this pointer stick. But <laughs> You know, in the Old Testament, there was what was called Sheol. And when people died, they went to Sheol. And it appears, as best we can tell, there's some mystery to it, but that there were two parts to Sheol. There was a hell side of Sheol, and there was a heaven side of Sheol back in the Old Testament. Now, the Greek word or New Testament word for Sheol is Hades. Uh, and in the New Testament, when the word Hades is used, it's only used of hell. It's only used of fire. I believe, and uh, this isn't something everyone agrees with, but I believe that the heavenly side of Sheol at the death of Christ and his resurrection moved up to paradise. And at that point, anyone who's died believing in Jesus Christ, their spirit went to be with the Lord in heaven. And that's why in the New Testament, you don't hear about a positive side of Hades anymore. You only hear about a hell side because whoever believed in him went ahead to heaven. Now, anyone who's died who hasn't believed and people who've died 
who have believed, their graves are like at that cemetery, right? Their bodies are in those graves. But their spirits aren't in those graves. Their spirits are not in dousement over in their graves. The spirit of those people have gone to a new place. Those who have died without Jesus have gone to Hades, and they're in torment. And they died once, and guess what? They get to die again. <laughs> they're going to die twice. And one day, although they're experiencing hell now, they're going to be resurrected just to be thrown into the lake of fire, and that's going to happen after the millennium. And then, So they're going to die twice. And those of us who believe in Jesus, we only die once. And our bodies go to be in the cemetery just like those other people, but our spirits rise to be with the Lord in paradise. Hallelujah. And you can see what a different fate that is, how significant this is, that we believe in Jesus while we have an opportunity because we're either going to a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and people are going to burn forever only to be resurrected, to be thrown into the lake of fire, or you're going to be in heaven with the Lord. Now, what I believe and what we teach here at this church is we believe that one day Jesus is coming back to rapture his church before the wrath of the tribulation. And at that time, what it's talked about is that the spirits of those who've uh, come back, who went ahead and died, those who believed in Jesus and their spirits have gone ahead to paradise, are going to come back with the Lord, but he's not coming back to earth at the rapture. He's going to be in the clouds, and, and he's going to rapture those who are living up to be with the Lord, and they're going to be with the Lord forever, and they won't then have to experience this tribulation time, this, this really difficult time that we're talking about now on earth. So how important it is that we believe in Jesus so that we're spell, spared not only the tribulation, but we're also spelled, spared eternity in hell where there's fire and where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, I'm kind of sad in a way that it's like I'm the one that has to bring that news. That should be really well known and talked about all over the world. And, and as a result of that, we would see the urgency of the gospel, wouldn't we? We'd see the importance of accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior now. So, if you put that back up, that same chart real quickly, I just want to share with you where we are. We've already covered the church age of Revelation 1 through 3. We've covered the church in heaven, I believe, in Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 6, it's called the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb. And that's when the tribulation begins. And this morning, we're taking in Revelation chapter 10 and 11. We're reaching right now in chapter 11, the midpoint of the tribulation, which is then called the great tribulation, which is going to take place in the last three and a half years. And we're heading to that point until we're waiting to the, to the return of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19, where he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. We saw in Revelation chapter 6, if you want to put up this next chart, we saw uh, the seven seals. And you might recall there was a pause between the sixth and seventh seal. And when we got to the seventh seal, there were seven trumpets. And we covered six of those trumpets in the last time two weeks ago when we covered the book of Revelation. I believe when we open up the seventh trumpet, it's when we're getting the final judgment of God, which then consists of seven bold judgments. In between the sixth and seventh trumpet, just like between the sixth and seventh seal, there's an interlude. We're in that interlude. We're in that pause. Six angels have blown six trumpets. There's a pause we're covering now, and then the seventh trumpet is going to be blown. And that's what we're in the midst of right now in this book. Um, you can see that on this next picture that's going to be put on the screen. You can see there were six trumpets covered through chapter 9. We're in the pause of chapter 10 and part of chapter 11. And then finally in chapter 11, which we'll get to today, the seventh trumpet is blown. So with that, let's pick it up in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And Father, we, we take in, God, your entire word because it's good and right to do so. Help us, Lord, to put in perspective the fact that you're coming to judge those who have not accepted you as your Lord and Savior. 
as their Lord and Savior. Help us, Father, to have a sense of urgency in accepting your gospel and also, Lord, a comfort knowing what you've done to save us. Open, God, our ears and our eyes now to see your word as it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelation 10, verse 1. Then I saw, and this is John, who's receiving this vision and is seeing this. Then I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little scroll, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the earth. Can you imagine this? He's seen a vision of an angel coming down and having as if this was the ocean and this was the earth. And he's holding a little scroll and John is seeing this angel in that kind of authority position. He's seeing this and he cried out with a loud voice. This is the angel. As when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Now, this is not just thunder, but actual words, words that are being spoken. And listen to what it says next. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, see their words, I was about to write. So John was going to write them down as he's writing down this vision in the book of Revelation to us so that we would know what God had for us. But this particular words that are uttered by this angel, John's told not to write. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. You know, I think one thing that is really important is that we don't know everything. Here these angels are speaking, and John wanted to write it down, but he was told not to write it down. We don't know everything. And even in some things we think we could be wrong. We do the best we can to try to interpret scriptures honorably as we can. That's my goal as I study the scriptures. Um, but I think we need to offer respect and compassion to other people who are sincerely trying to discern the word of God and are trying to go by the word of God, but sometimes have a different view than ours. And in the same way, I think it's helpful for people that may disagree with what we hold to, that they would say, because we don't know everything, and because we're fallible, that they should also give respect to someone like us or me, who may have a different view than them. And in that way, we can have unity. Humility brings unity. That doesn't mean that I don't hold strongly to what I believe and to what I'm proclaiming about Revelation and about everything that I've been teaching. I've been studying it very diligently to do my best to honor the Lord and be in his truth. But it is possible as humans we can be wrong. That's humility. Humility brings unity. Pride brings division. So when you say you've got it right and everyone else is crazy for even thinking what they think, that's pride, and that brings disunity. That's not what I do, uh, and that's not what the people I listen to do. Even though they hold firmly and strongly to what they believe, they do it in humility. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the earth lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. And what that means is this seventh trumpet's coming. You can tell by the fact there's a pause that this seventh trumpet is a big deal, and it's coming, and this judgment is coming, and that's what's being said here. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel who's going to blow that seventh trumpet, when he is about to sound that trumpet, then the mystery of God is finished as he proclaimed the good news to his slaves, the prophets. And in a sense, 
even though the seventh trumpet contains a lot of things, there's a lot that's going to go on after the seventh trumpet is blown. But what we're going to see in a moment is in this seventh trumpet, we're going to get flash forwarded to the future, to the return of Jesus Christ. So it's like as though, even though when the seventh trumpet blows, there's a lot to happen, God is going to kind of go in summation and take us to the end. And it's as though the end is coming in the seventh trumpet. We're on our way to the end. That's what's being said. Verse 8, Then the voice which I heard from Evan, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. He's got this little scroll. Now, what scroll is that? You know, remember that there was, uh, God the Father was holding a scroll in the midst of uh, the heavenly scene of Revelation 4, 5, and no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to take its seals except for Jesus. And then he was able to take the scroll out of Father's God hands and hope. Some people believe it's the same scroll. I don't necessarily think that's the case. We don't know, but it is a scroll that John is going to take and listen to what happens. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. You know, this isn't the only time that the word of God was eaten. It was, you can read about it being eaten in Jeremiah 15, 16, Ezekiel 3, 1 through 3, Proverbs 16, 24, and in Psalm 119, it says it this way, How sweet is your word to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And almost every time that the word of God is eaten, it's said to be like cake or to be sweet. And it is, isn't it? Isn't the word of God beautiful and wonderful? And I'm so thankful that we have it to guide our lives. Amen? But in this particular case, it's still sweet, but it's also bitter. Because John's reading about two wonderful things. Well, one, one sad thing and one wonderful thing. He's reading about the seventh trumpet or taking in the seventh trumpet and all the judgment that's coming. And that part makes him bitter. But the end is also in sight where Jesus is coming back to rule and reign and where the church is going to reign with him. And that part is sweet. And that's why, to John, it's both bitter and sweet. And they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And John hasn't finished yet. It's as though we're in the setting where John is, is, has drafted now what he's seen and what he's heard from the scroll and He's through 11 or 10 chapters of the book of Revelation, but we still have all the way to chapter 22. So John's got to keep writing. He's got to keep finishing this book of Revelation, and that's what I believe is being said there too. Now we go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. Then a measuring rod like a staff was given to me, saying, Get up and measure the sanctuary of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Now isn't this interesting? Do you know that there's no temple in Jerusalem right now? And we don't need a temple, by the way. The church, we are the temple. The Holy Spirit has come and live inside of us. And we don't need a temple. Why do they need a temple in the tribulation? Well, I believe it's for Jews and unbelievers and not for the church. The church doesn't need a temple. But a temple is going to be rebuilt during the tribulation. It could start maybe before the tribulation even begins. Or it's possible that it will be built at the very beginning of the tribulation. Will it be to the same size and structure as to what it was before? I have no idea. But in some way, the temple is going to be restored in Jerusalem. Uh, by the way, at the midpoint of the tribulation, at the abomination of desolation, that's something that happens at the temple in Jerusalem. So we need that temple to exist in order for all of this to take place. And I believe it's coming one day. There's talk about rebuilding a temple. There has been for years. And I believe it'll happen. So John's asked to measure it at this point. Measure the temple. But he's, he's told this, and this is very interesting, and leave out the court which is outside the sanctuary. He's only supposed to measure the t tabernacle or temple proper, like the holy of holy places and the most holy place, but he's not to measure everything else. 
For it has been given to the Gentiles, to the nations, and they will trample the holy city underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. That's three and a half years of the tribulation period. Did you know that Jesus talked about this? In, in Luke 21.21, 21, 21, I'll begin there. This is Jesus now. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. This is talking about the great tribulation. And those who are in the midst of the city must leave. And those who are in the countryside must not enter the city because these are days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be filled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath against this people. Is that for you? And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that's very interesting. Times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles. And uh, you, you might recall just a second ago, I told you that for 42 months, the Gentiles are going to trample things underfoot. I want to put to you a chart now. I might need that pointing stick again about the times of the Gentiles. So, times of the Gentiles, do you remember Israel entered the promised land? That's not even on this chart, but they got victory and they defeated their enemies and God gave David and Solomon great reign and rule in the promised land, right? But after Solomon died, his two sons took over and they divided the kingdom. You might remember, uh, well, Jeroboam went to the north, they were called Israel. Rehoboam was in the south, they were called Judah. They were at war with each other. Eventually, the Assyrian Empire came in and took over uh, the northern, what was now called Israel, and they're called the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Benjamin and Judah were to the south. They survived the Assyrian attack, but then Nebuchadnezzar came in, and he came in and defeated uh, Jerusalem and tore down uh, Jerusalem and deported the people to Babylon. You guys kind of remember this, those of you who are going through the Bible journey. It's important to know all this. Well, when they got put into Babylon's captivity, that's, that was the end of Israel was no more. And that's when the times of the Gentiles began. And even today, Israel got restored and they're back in their land, but there's a mosque sitting in the middle of Jerusalem. There's a Muslim mosque where the temple is there. And as you guys know, the Palestinians are living right among them in Israel and they're at war with each other. So Israel does not even have their full land back now. So even though they're there, this is still the times of the Gentiles. And what most scholars believe is that the times of the Gentiles is not going to end until Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign. When he ushers in his millennium and he's back on top again, just like when Jerusalem and the Jews were on top before they got deported, that's when the times of the Gentiles will end, is at that time. So that's what it means, the times of the Gentiles. And I will give authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. How long is 1,260 days? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. So now God's going to bring about two special witnesses that are going to be in the tribulation to be a witness for Jesus Christ. This is on top of the 144,000 Jews who have converted to Christianity who are sealed. Remember, we learned about that in Revelation chapter 7. Those 144,000 Jews who've come to Jesus are sealed so that they can't be harmed during the tribulation. So there is going to be a very strong witness for Jesus in the tribulation, those 144,000, as well as these two witnesses, as well as people who knew about Jesus, and there's going to be a lot of them, and a lot of people who go to a lot of churches who have not fully accepted Jesus and been born again, and when Jesus comes to rapture his church, they're not going to go because they weren't born again. And once we're raptured, I believe they're going to figure out what they missed out on, and some of them are going to turn to Jesus too, but if they're not part of the 144,000 who are sealed, they're going to have to give their lives for their faith, 
during the tribulation and be willing to be martyred, and then they too will receive what we receive, they will be allowed to be with Jesus forever in heaven as well. But these are witnesses. A witness is one who testifies, uh, even sometimes who is martyred for their testimony. And, and they are going to, they are, they're going to prophesy. Now, we're going to put up the word there. It's up there already. Why, we always think of prophecy as like some future thing. Like I'm going to predict a future event. And yes, that is the word for prophecy, but it's not just that. So this is what prophecy means, to prophesy with the idea of foretelling. That's what we've already talked about. Let's go to the next aspect of the definition. To utter forth, declare a thing which can only be known by divine revelation. To break forth under sudden impulse and lofty discourse or praise of the divine counsels. So you, me, these two witnesses... If, if God swept you up by the Holy Spirit and you began speaking as though the Holy Spirit was speaking through you, and I'm not talking about how I can or you can write new words of God, we're not going to create new scripture. Scripture, scripture, we're not adding to that. But there are times God can inspire you to speak and he is using these two witnesses to declare the praises of God, to break forth under sudden impulse and lofty discourse or praise. And they're trying to lead people to Jesus Christ during the tribulation. Hallelujah. Now, some people believe that these two are Moses and Elijah. There's other others' names that come up, like Enoch, who they could be. I think Moses and Elijah are probably the two best guesses, but they're guesses. We don't know, all right? I'm not going to get into a debate about who they are because the scripture doesn't tell us who they are, but it's very interesting. We'll see in a moment that they have the ability to create drought and bring rain, and guess who did that? Elijah. And they have the ability to turn water into blood. And who did that? Now, God really did all of it, but who did that? Moses. So those are some of the reasons why it could be uh, Moses and Elijah. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. You remember who the lampstands were? The church. In the first three chapters, the church. And these guys are going to experience a the same fate as the church in a moment. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wishes to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the authority to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They also have the authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they wish. And when they have finished their witness, the beast, now that's the Antichrist, that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, Jerusalem, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations look at their dead bodies for three and a half days. That's a literal three and a half days, not three and a half years and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. They're just going to let them rot. And those who dwell on the earth, and we're going to take a look at that term again today, because this is a term that's only used in the book of Revelation, and it's only used to discuss people who are in the tribulation. It's the only time it's used. These are two witnesses for Jesus, but the people who are on earth, it says this, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them that they've been killed and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now I want to talk to you about this dwell on the earth. You might recall this, one of the glorious verses from Revelation 3.10. It says, because you, now who, who are we talking about in Revelation 3? Who's that? The church, thank you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, I believe that's the tribulation, which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now we're in Revelation 6. Where are we in Revelation 6? Revelation 6 is the beginning of what? The tribulation, thank you. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Master Holy and True, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who on the earth. Revelation 8, where are we in Revelation 8? 
in the tribulation. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in midheaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell in heaven. Woe, woe, woe to those who are the church. No. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. And now where we are now. And, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, these two witnesses, and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. And one more I want to share with you in Revelation 13. So is this, it says all. So would this be you? Just want all who dwell on the earth. What does all mean? All. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which were given to him to do in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So I really do believe, church, that the term earth dweller is not the church, but it's Jews who have rejected the Messiah and unbelievers who are going to be on earth during the tribulation and not you. Now, in Revelation 11, verse 15, we get a fast forward. Now, remember I told you that when the seventh trumpet blows, there's a lot to take place in the seventh trumpet. Remember, there's going to be seven bold judgments that we haven't gotten to yet. And we still have, and from Revelation 11, we have seven more chapters to get to Revelation 18 before the tribulation ends, okay? But it's considered like the summation. It's considered like this is the final trumpet. Therefore, we get flash-forwarded to the return of Jesus for a moment. And there is flash-forwards and flashbacks in Revelation, which makes it, you know, takes more time to discern. But here we get flash-forwarded. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, and this is what we have to look forward to one day, church. Hallelujah. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord, of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the 24 elders, and I believe that represents you, who sit on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worship God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who is and was, and because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. This is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. A thousand years, hallelujah. And the nations were enraged and your rage came. And the time came for the dead to be judged. Now I believe he's actually flash forwarding all the way to the end of the millennial reign in this passage. And the, for the, the time came for the dead to be judged and to give your reward to your slaves, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his sanctuary, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hail storm. What this reminds me of, church, is that is towards the end when we're going to experience the second death, not us, not we, but those who have died who have not accepted Jesus. Let me go there I'm going to pick it up, and this first part is not going to be on your screen, Revelation 20. Then I saw the thrones, and they sat on them. I believe that's the church, by the way, and we were told we were given thrones to rule and reign on in Revelation chapter 3. And judgment was given to them, that's us. And I saw, and these people, hallelujah, get to heaven too, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their witness of Jesus, these are those who come to Christ during the tribulation and are killed for their faith, and they get ushered to heaven too. And because of the word of God, and who also had not worshipped the beast or his image. See, the church didn't worship the beast or his image either. And had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Hallelujah. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were finished. Now that's the people that have died and gone to Hades. The people that have died and are in torment in hell right now, they still have not been resurrected to die again, which is going to happen in a moment. This is the first resurrection. 
not that one, but this one. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death, that's all of us. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God. Now, who's called priests of God right now? The church, right? They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. That's us. Now, at the end of the book of Revelation, towards the end, in Revelation 20, 12 through 15, this will be on the screen. This is the resurrection now. The people who've died and who have gone to Hades, they're in hell now, but it's a temporary hell, and they're waiting (laughs) to be resurrected only to be thrown into the lake of fire, and that's what happens now. Then I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's not for you. The second death is the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, we get rejected a lot in this life, sharing our faith. If people only knew what was in store, if they only knew that it's the love of God that prompts us to try to get their attention, so they don't have to die twice. So we face rejection and praise God, we also see fruit. We see people who do respond to the gospel and are saved and as a result, they're going to live with the Lord forever. You know what this you know what makes this powerful in you? Believing it. If you believe hell and torment are waiting those who deny Jesus Christ, an eternal life is waiting those who accept him. That gives us the proper motivation to be the people of God. Judgment is coming. But hallelujah, it's not for those who believe in Jesus. I close with this verse where the Apostle Paul talks about some special women and all of us. And he says this, Indeed, I ask you also, genuine companion, help these women who have contended together alongside of me in the gospel, with also Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. That's what we are. That's what we are today. We are fellow workers working together as a church body, serving God's kingdom for his glory And as a result of our faith in him, we put ourselves to work for God and say, God, I want to be used by you. And because of our faith in him, hallelujah, one day, because our names are in that book of life, we're going to be with the Lord forever. That's something to celebrate. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. God, we thank you for the great comfort that you give our lives. We thank you for your love, God. We thank you that you took the cross in order to forgive us and give us a promise of eternal life. Oh God, well up in us now the desire just to come alongside our church, fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and just be a fellow worker for your kingdom. We thank you, God, for putting our name there. Oh God, help us now to remain in faith in you 
all the way to the end. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.